Yeah, good afternoon. So yesterday in the first lecture, I discussed spatial organization of cells by mechanochemical pattern formation, in particular in the cell cortex. Today, I want to come to another important theme of spatial organization of cells via phase separation and the formation of emulsion droplets, which serve as chemical centers. That's subject phase separation in active systems. And of course, I'm interested in active systems out of equilibrium. And we have the present of chemical reactions um, that are fed by some fuel that keep the system active. The theme is the same as yesterday. Um, I'd, I'd like to highlight um, collaborators on the problem of um, phase separation. In particular, we've been working for a long time with Tony Hyman, and we have a strong collaboration in Dresden between the two institutes. Um, I'd like to highlight um, in particular Omar, Rabea, Tyler, Christoph, um, who are working on these problems, and Louise on the experimental side. Now, cells have to organize biochemistry in space. So there are compl complex biochemical pathways and processes which sometimes have to be kept separate. They are organized spatially, and the, the, the cell is a spatial, spatial temporal pattern of activity. And the classical picture of how com chemical compartments are established is that membranes separate regions of different chemical composition of different biochemistry from each other. And that defines the classical organelles, the cells. Um, and you see those sort of a schematic picture, the Golgi with the mitochondria, and so on. Um, so these are all compartments that have membranes to distinguish different chemical regions. But there are also compartments without membranes that compartmentalize biochemistry, but they are not separated by a membrane. Here, I'll show you a few examples. Classical example is the centrosome, which I'll talk about a bit later. It's a spherical assembly of material that provides a signaling center and that is important for the organization of the mitotic spindle during division. In the cell nucleus, <clears throat> sort of segregated from the chromatin, are nucleoli, which are um, regions where ribosome components are produced. Um, this is an example of a stress, of a stress granules outside of the nucleus, which suddenly form when cells are stressed in different ways. They appear and disappear. Um, and one system which we've been particularly interested in for a long time which <clears throat> are these P granules that are labeled here, which are um, um, topics explaining protein RNA assemblies that play a role in germline determination, in this case in nematodes. Now, um, let's come first to these pea granules, and I can connect this to my talk of yesterday. I mentioned yesterday that we have an, an asymmetric cell division, domains in the membrane which define cell polarity, and that also leads to the situation that when the cell divides asymmetrically, the membranes are different for the two daughter cells. But interestingly, the cytoplasm is also different. There are components of the cytoplasm that segregate to one side of the cell. These are these pea granules. And as the cell divides, one of the daughter cells gets these pea granules. That will be the pre precursor of the germline cells of the organism. And these are important for the germline. And the other cell doesn't get these peak granules. So the cytoplasm is segregated. And there's a relationship between the segregation of peak granules in the cytoplasm and the polarity in the cell membrane. Um, as this segregation is achieved with the help of this polarity, the membrane that sets up chemical concentration gradients across the cell. And these chemical concentration gradients somehow guide the segregation of peak granules to one side of the cell. Let's look at what happens in the cell. So this is now um, one molecule labeled GPF, uh, PGL1 labeled with GPF, that shows that this molecule, this protein is accumulated in these pea granules. 
make the way to visualize the peak granules. Now, before the cell cell divides and before things are really asymmetric, the peak granules are everywhere in, in the in the cell and cytoplasm. And if you now follow this during cell division, um, that's the process that I discussed yesterday. Somehow they segregate, and then the cell divides, and only one of the daughters gets these components. So what are peak granules? So these are non-membrane-bound condensates of proteins and RNA. They are found in the cytoplasm of all germ cell precursors. And of course, the egg that starts the whole process is also a germ cell precursor. And it's a germ cell itself before it was fertilized. So we start from the egg with peak granules. They segregate to one side. We get um, this asymmetric division. And one of the cells has the peak granules. Then we go to the next round of divisions, which I explained yesterday. And then again, only one cell retains these peak granules. In the end, one finds these structures only in the germ cells of the organism. They're segregated in all these asymmetric divisions, always to the right cell. Um, and they're implicated in the specification of germ cells. Now, one can ask the question, how does this segregation work? Why do they end up on one side? How is this achieved? And of course, I've shown you yesterday all these flows in the cell. The cytoplasm is stirred because of the flows on the surface. First Im impression one may have when looking at this movie is that the peak granules are carried in the flow. However, this is actually not true. And uh, the, the reason principally is that, as I showed you yesterday, the flow fields, they, are, they circle. So in the center, they may go one way, but at the periphery, they have to go back because the fluid inside has a conserved volume. And there cannot be a directed flow from one side to the other. And in fact, if one tracks the granules, the green and red are tracks moving in different directions, the, the mass transport balances. So the flows do not carry net material to one side. So the flows are not the answer to the segregation question, even though the flows are also generated by the asymmetry at the surface. What happens is that assembly and disassembly of these granules is spatially inhomogeneous. On the interior side, these structures tend to dissolve, to disassemble, while on the anterior side, they grow and assemble. And this process is mediated by the gradient I showed you before of a protein called MAX5 that is set up with the help of the domains in the cell membrane. Now, <clears throat> when studying this problem in collaboration with Cliff Brangwin, who at the time was in, in Dresden, working between the labs of Tony Heimann and myself, uh, we realized that these structures, even though they're called peak granules, they behave a lot like liquid droplets. And we have to think of this problem as a problem of an emulsion with many droplets that grow and shrink, and in this case, a spatially inhomogeneous emulsion. But it brings us to the physics of droplets. And that's the key theme um, of my talk today. And um, when we discuss droplets, we can start with a well-known phenomena of droplets of everyday life. Um, they reflect the coexistence of two phases. One, the droplet phase and coexists with the outside. It could, if water droplets in air, there would be a coexistence between fluid and gas. But of course, one can also have droplets within a fluid, fluid-fluid coexistence. And that's what we are dealing with when we're looking at condensates in a cell. A question? So the... The best I can say that what I said before is that they're involved in the determination of the germ cells. The germ cells need them. And all precursors of germ cells have them. And they have RNA processing proteins and RNA. But the precise role is not really understood. It's an important biological question of what exactly are they doing? Somehow they process the RNA. Maybe they process and collect certain RNA that the germline absolutely needs. But this is speculation. But it's, it's interesting yeah, that, that there's a clear distinction between germ cells and not germ cells. And the germ cells deal with these granules. But moving away from the biology to the physics, I'll discuss droplets. Um, and we come to 
Droplets are typically round, spherical. That is because they have a surface tension and minimization of free energy involves minimization of the surface area. Um, these are liquid-like structures, so we can discuss their viscosity. And um, since we are in living cells, we cannot um, rest with the simple discussion of passive droplets that we usually encounter, but we have to think of them also as centers for chemistry, for chemical reactions. They're part of these chemical reactions are drive the system out of equilibrium, and we have to move from passive droplets to active droplets and discuss what is the physics of droplets that are maintained away from equilibrium by chemical activity. Another way to think about the problem is that in the cell cytoplasm, we have a large number of different components. If they are well mixed, then we have the classical picture of a simple um, homogeneous fluid of many components. But such a system can undergo demixing, and then we form a droplet where certain components are concentrated, enriched, coexisting with an environment where other components are enriched. And therefore, we have two different chemical compositions coexisting. There's no need to have a membrane in between. It's the thermodynamics of the phase separation, which maintains those distinct concentrations at equilibrium. Um, and we have droplet in a fluid. Uh, everyday example would be oil and water. And the biological example is pea granules in cytoplasm. To show that, to see that these pea granules behave like liquid droplets, um, was revealed by watching them in cells and also in the germ cells. So one can observe them fusing. You see two pea granules in a living cell, um, meeting and fusing. If one squeezes the organism and generates hydrodynamic flows, one can see that this deforms the pea granules. So this is now in the germ line of the adult. These are nuclei in the cells, in the germ cells. And the nuclei are wet by little droplets of pea granule material sitting on the surface of the nuclei. It's the same fluorescent label, that's why we see them here. And if we now squeeze the embryo, then they start to flow and to behave like liquid droplets. They, they move away from the, from the nuclei in the flow that is generated externally. And already in this living system, particularly with the fusion, allows one to estimate material properties in a very rough way. One can come to estimates of viscosity and surface tension particularly when one does, looks at this fusion. But in fact, one can determine the ratio of surface tension and viscosity. And having an idea of the viscosity, for example, from diffusion coefficient measurements inside the droplet, one can determine the surface tension itself, which is a very low surface tension as compared, for example, to the daily life experience of air-water surface tension. It's much higher than the surface tension of, of, of these droplets. Just a few words about um, droplet fusion. Um, if you have a droplet with a surface tension, there is a pressure difference between inside and outside, which comes from the surface tension sort of, sort of compressing the spherical droplet. And this so-called Laplace pressure, where H is the curvature, gamma is the surface tension, is higher if the curvature is higher. And if we bring two droplets um, together, there is a sort of force driving them into the spherical shape. There will be hydrodynamic flows relaxing into this shape and calculate them. So it will be the flow pattern in such a fusion event driven by pressure gradients, which come from, from the fact that the curvature at the surface defines pressure locally. And um, there is now a relaxation process to the spherical shape that happens on a characteristic time scale that is given by the, the ratio of viscosity to surface tension. One can also study these systems in vitro, so one can purify these proteins, ones that were labeled by GFP, and then look at them in buffer. And if one concentrates them, um, they 
from droplets and an emulsion. It turns out that if one does that without RNA, one needs slightly high, at least higher concentrations than the proteins are concentrated inside the cell. But if one adds RNA, they would phase separate at the concentrations that one finds in vivo. One can reconstitute this phase separation test tube, and here you see a solution with peak granule droplets where they sediment <coughs> under the microscope because they have a higher density surrounding. Then they merge with the um, phase that accumulates on the bottom. Now, DGL free protein droplets. And here I show you a real emulsion in vitro where you see these droplets um, form a, an emulsion at high density and they tend to coarsen this emulsion because partly they fuse. You can see here, but there's also this process we will explain in a moment, Oswald ripening, by which they also tend to coarsen and grow. There's another example of a fusion event where one, um, which one can use to estimate um, viscosities of surface tensions. I think it's a fusion event. Um, in vitro, I don't think you see it. In vivo, many things may happen. Yes? Um, so, so what often happens, you cannot really follow these things forever, and what often happens is that they in vitro tend to harden, it's not, it's, that they somehow slow down their dynamics. I will not have time today to go into these issues. The principle one can now measure with more sophisticated me methods the material properties, and we can also st study whether they depend on time, whether they have a steady state, whether... Um, but often what happens in the experiment is that they slow down the dynamics and then they're not dynamic anymore. And that's typical for what happens in vitro. It doesn't happen in vivo. In, in, in vitro, it also doesn't happen for, for all molecules, but it's, it's, it's very common. Yeah. So let's now take, discuss first the basic physics of phase separation and of demixing. Um, so I will need concepts of thermodynamics first, so um, and then starting from equilibrium thermodynamic phase separation, I will later add active processes like chemical reactions. But in order to discuss phase separation, let me first remind you of some basic thermodynamics. And for simplicity, I will discuss a minimal system of two components, but what I'm saying can be easily generalized to as many components as you want. And the starting point in thermodynamics to discuss this is the free energy of a liquid mixture, which is characterized by the number of molecules in a volume V. And so the Helmholtz free energy, I call it F, which is a function of molecule numbers Na and B. It's a function of the volume, which I put them, and of temperature. And in principle, this can be calculated from a microscopic interactions using a partition function. This is the mechanics. And the idea is if one knows what this free energy function is, one has all the information about the thermodynamics of the system. And from this, I can now define chemical potentials. In this case, mu A, species A and species B. EF, DNA, other derivative of the, the other variables are not changed. UB, EF, DNB. I can also define the pressure, which is minus DF, DV, and I can define the entropy minus DF, DT. Now, in practice, it's often useful also to consider a different ensemble where not the volume is fixed, but where the pressure is fixed. That's particular if you do chemistry, that's usually what you're doing. The pressure is 
is, is given, but you don't have a fixed volume. In that case, we have the Gibbs free energy, which is a function of an A and B pressure and temperature. And this is related to the Helmholtz free energy as F plus P times V. And then we have again the chemical potentials as the derivatives of G. Um, now we can calculate the volume as dg dp. Entropy is still the same, dg dt. Um, and one concept that's important is the molecular volume. It's the volume per individual molecule in the system. This is most easily calculated from the Gibbs free energy because I can define V let's say Va, the molecular volume of molecular species A, as the derivative of the, of the volume with respect to the number of molecules of type A. Now, at constant pressure, I add one more molecule, and I ask, what is the change in volume of my system? And that's the molecular volume. Now, this is volume is dGdp. I can write as d dNa e GDP, and since I can exchange the two derivatives, I can write this also as DDP, DDNA of G, and this is now the chemical potential. So it's the molecular volume is the derivative of the chemical potential with respect to the pressure. <clears throat> now, a li limit that we usually take, which is very convenient, is that is the idea that the system is incompressible. That's not strictly true. You press very hard, you can change the volume, but the small pressures that we're dealing with are so small that we don't change any volumes. And this incompressibility we can impose by saying that the molecular volumes, V A and V B, are fixed numbers. They cannot be changed. Even if you compress the system, the molecular volumes will not really change. <laughs> and in that case, we can write a volume as the V A N A plus V B N B. And these are parameters. These are not complicated functions. <clears throat> and um, in this incompressible limit, if I impose the volume, N A and N A B are no longer independent variables. So I can eliminate, let's say, the number of A molecules when I impose V and N B. So I can then introduce a new function, I call it F bar, where I eliminate N A, so it's only a function of N B, V and T. I can calculate it by eliminating N A. And I can calculate N A from this equation. It will be V minus VB NB over VA, comma NA, sorry, NB, comma V, comma T. Yeah. And this function now only has three variables left. And when I now de calculate somehow the equivalent to a chemical potential by deriving with respect to NB, this new function, I call this mu bar. This is df bar dnb. And I mean, I do that in practice. I can use it using this definition. And the nb is here and is here. By the way, if I derive with respect to the first variable, it gives me mu a. So what I find, this is equals to mu b minus bb over va mu a. So the chemical potential mu bar is somehow a different difference chemical potential between these two components. Yeah. I can also calculate something like a pressure using this function. It can't be the real pressure because since the Chris system is incompressible, I can't compress it. So in, in this function, if I keep an A and B fixed and I try to compress the system by changing the volume, for an incompressible system, it's impossible. If I vary the volume here and do something else, I squeeze the system 
keeping the NB molecules fixed, but allowing the A, NA molecules to leave. And that means that the quantity DF bar dV, which I call pi, is not the hydrostatic pressure of the system, but it's the osmotic pressure. So in this case, I have these two quantities, and I have this function. Now, it's very convenient to work with this function here. And since I'm dealing here with a spatially homogeneous system, well mixed, let's not worry about phase separation yet. I put these molecules in a box, everything is well mixed, everything is spatially homogeneous. And I can use a scaling argument and write function f bar of nb, comma v, comma t. If I make the volume bigger and bigger at constant concentration, I will increase the free energy proportional to the system size. So you can write this as a volume times a function that is the volume density of the free energy. And this function only depends on the concentration. The concentration NB is defined as the number of molecules per volume. And this, is now, this now defines the thermodynamic of, of my system. Now, if I do that, I can now calculate mu bar, the difference relative chemical potential, and the osmotic pressure as a function of f, which is a function of nb. And I find that mu bar is simply given by d little f dnb. And I find that the osmotic pressure is given by minus f plus mu, mu bar times phi. That follows directly from these, from, from these definitions. Now, very often, sorry, nb, I'm, I went, went one step too fast. Now, very often, um, it's convenient, instead of using concentrations, use volume fractions. And I will also do that in my talk. So a little n is always a concentration. Number of molecules per unit volume, that's what one usually uses in chemistry. And, but to, to discuss phase separation, it's often relevant to know what is the fraction of volume occupied by certain molecules. And then I, I write f bar, um, n b v, T as V times a function of phi. Now I'm using here for simplicity the same, the same symbol, but these are actually slightly different functions. And where phi is the volume fraction is defined as, uh, I have to need an extra line. Phi is defined as um, BB and B over V, so the molecular volume times the number of molecules is the volume of the occupied by the molecules of type B divided by the system volume as the volume fraction. And it can also be written as VB times NB, concentration times molecular volume. <clears throat> and then we have a similar expression. I can then also define a relative chemical potential by deriving F with respect to phi. And and also the, write the osmotic pressure, maybe I just write them here, also called as u mu bar equals df d phi. And then I have a version of the osmotic pressure where I have mu bar times phi. Yeah. Now, with this framework, we can now discuss phase separation and phase coexistence based on the functional form of the function f of phi. And I show you on this slide a typical example of what this looks like um, when we have phase separation. That's the function f as a function of volume fraction phi. And the volume fraction can go from 0 to 1. And phi, the way I define it, is the volume fraction of the b component. Yeah? I, phi is defined as, as nb times vb. 
So I think of a droplet that is B rich and the environment which is A rich, by two components, and then large phi corresponds to inside of the droplet and small phi is outside, outside of the droplet. And now if this free energy function has such a non monotonous shape, then we can have, or then we have a coexistence between two different phases. And this phase coexistence can be found by using this word Maxwell construction. When it looks for a straight line that touches the free energy function um, as a tangent in two points, and the values of phi found at the so determined points are the coexisting con concentrations of volume fraction at equilibrium that can coexist inside and outside. And just to explain where this comes from, um, so phase coexistence implies that the chemical potentials inside and outside or in the two phases are the same. That's, that's equilibrium. And in the case, if I'm using my variables mu bar and pi, this implies that mu bar inside the droplet must be the same as mu bar outside the droplet. And pi inside the droplet is the same as pi outside the droplet. And um, if I'm now using that pi equals minus f plus mu bar phi, then I can see this construction. First, the idea that mu bar inside is the same as mu bar outside means that at the coexistence points, the tangents of f must be the same. The slopes must be the same. <laughs> the f, the phi must be the same in two phases. They coexist. But there's a second condition. You know, there could be other ways to have two equal tangents. I could also have a steep tangent here and a steep tangent here that would satisfy the upper condition. But I also have to satisfy that the osmotic pressures are the same, so that this thing is the same. And this implies now that F in minus F out equals mu bar phi in minus phi out. And we have used the fact that mu bar is the same in and out. Now you see that this condition is exactly satisfied by my tangent construction because the difference phi in minus phi out is exactly the distance along the axis here. To multiply this with mu bar is a slope. Um, I'm going from here to here. And this must be the difference in the free energies, F here and F here. So that's why the Maxwell construction produces the correct equilibrium condition for the concentrations inside and outside. Now I could illustrate this more by giving you an example of what such a free energy in practice could look like. Because in the free energy function depends on the complexity of the molecules involved and can be in practice very difficult to find. But there are simple models that one often uses for liquid mixtures and the very important one is the Flory Huggins model. And that has a free energy function f of phi, which essentially has two important contributions. One comes from entropy, essentially entropy of mixing. So um, if there are no interactions between molecules, then the system is well mixed because that's the highest entropy state. The free energy contains entropy. Um, as an important ingredient. And that part has the form um, phi log phi plus 1 minus phi log 1 minus phi. That's the entropy of mixing in the so-called Flory Huggins model. And then we also need an interaction term that allows the system to phase separate. And there the idea is that if A and B components come together, there is an interaction energy interaction energy I call chi, and then the probability for an A and B molecule to meet is the product of the concentration of A times the concentration of B, and if, and if I do that with my volume fractions, it gives me a term of phi times one minus phi. Now phi is proportional to the concentration of B, and one minus phi is proportional to the concentration of A. 
And then in general, molecules A and B have their own internal energies, which can be different. This gives me a linear term as well. So this is an example, it's just a model that I can use to, to discuss phase separation. I wrote it for the simple case where the vol molecular volumes are the same of the two species. Um, then it has a symmetry between phi and one minus phi. And this has such a phase transition as a function of the interaction strength. And maybe just to illustrate, for this Flory Huggins model, I can calculate nu bar um, as the df d phi. Um, if you take the derivative of this function, get abt, pull this out, then we have log phi minus log 1 minus phi <coughs> plus chi times 1 minus 2 phi plus omega, and maybe also for completeness, I also write the osmotic pressure, which is minus kbt log 1 minus phi plus chi phi squared. Mm. Yeah. That's enough for the moment. So now I've explained you everything that was on the slide. Um, we have the coexistence of the chemical potential must be the same. This will also imply, if one does it, the calculation that the pressure must be the same. And this is for true phase equilibrium between two macroscopic phases. If we look at droplets, there is a subtlety, and it has to do, you know, before I do that, let's first come from here to the phase diagram. Um, so calculating now the region where phases coexist, and we have demixing in this interval of volume fraction outside, we have um, homogeneous phases, and th these values are the coexisting concentrations. And from this, we can now draw a phase diagram. Um, typically, this depends on temperature. So for a given temperature, we have such a, such a function. If we increase the temperature, we at some point we are losing this hump, and then the system is again mixed. That gives then rise to this typical type of phase diagram as a function of temperature and concentration. Um, where we, have, we, have, we have a homogeneous phase, which is A-rich at low B concentration, homogeneous phase, which is B-rich, High phase concentration, a coexistence of, of B rich phase with an A rich phase in this region between. Now we come to the droplet. In the case of a droplet, there is, as I mentioned before, an extra complication, which is the Laplace pressure, which means that the coexistence condition where the chemical potentials are the same involves a jump in pressure, which is the so called Laplace pressure, which I mentioned already. And in our Maxwell construction, this then implies a shift um, in the construction. So we still have the same slopes, but there is an extra shift. In fact, in this, this, in this equation, there will be an extra shift of 2 gamma over R, which is the Laplace pressure. And the osmotic pressure inside and outside is no longer the same. But we can still use this logic and this idea to calculate now the concentration inside and outside of a droplet, which are now no longer only dependent on the free energy function itself, but also depends on the radius of the droplet via, via this extra term. Now let's first look at what this means for an embryo, where we have droplets formed in emulsion used to segregate these components during cell division. And the first question one can ask is, do we actually see <coughs> the consequence of this phase diagram? So if we are in a, in a phase where we have droplets, the demixed phase, and we increase the temperature, we may leave it and we have a mixed phase. This we can actually do in, in, in the embryo. And I show you here the experiment above, where the temperature is now shifted from 15 degrees to 27 degrees. 
while below is the control where we keep it at 17 degrees all the time. And as we decrease the temperature, we dissolve all the droplets. That's, of course, we don't know when, at which temperature does it happen. We are lucky here that it happens while the embryo is still happy and not yet fried. But of course, these are already high temperatures. And in fact, at these temperatures, the embryo, the, the, the animal loses its, its ability to, to be, its fertility, which is, which is sort of interesting in the context that these granules are, re are related to germ cells and the functioning of the germ line. Um, we can now show that it is reversible by going back, decreasing the temperature again, 27 to 50 degrees here again, parallel the control, and then they reappear. They really, the formation and dissolution of these peak granules is actually temperature dependent, as you expect in the simple, from such a simple thermodynamic argument of, of phase separation. Yes? So when you do the reverse transition, but there's already a segregation to one compound. Why is it not homogeneous? It's because of the max 5 gradient, which makes the phase transition position dependent. And as I said, the segregation happens because droplets grow on one side but dissolve on the other side. So those can't grow here because in this region, the system is not in the, in, in the conditions where it demixes. And here is another condition where it demixes. If you, could, if you could do it much before the max 5 gradient is established. And one can also make perturbations where the max 5 gradient is abolished. It's homogeneous. Like so there yeah. are lots of experiments one can do. But it is not so easy, these experiments. I'll just show you these examples. Um, now, so far, I've to, and this comes to your question, yeah, so far I've discussed it as if it was a homogeneous system, but in practice it's an inhomogeneous system, where the disassembly is localized, here, the assembly is localized here. And one way to think about it is that we have now this okay, max 5 gradient. This is, by the way, a fluorescence intensity picture of this max 5 protein, which allows us to quantify this concentration gradient. One can show there's a causal relationship between this gradient and the segregation. And the idea is now that the, we have to deal with, higher, more, with more components in the system. So the max 5 also interacts with the components. Um, and um, the phase transition of p granule material depends on the concentration of the max 5. So more recently, we have developed a more complex model for this process, which involves also the RNA and, 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 and um, discusses who binds to whom and what is the role of the RNA in the process. But I don't want to go into these details here. I just want to just show you here a simpler picture, um, which essentially now deals with a free component system. So I have here free, free volume fractions. They add up to 1. The density of my p granule material, density of yeah, the solution, and the density of the max 5 protein. And this is, this is now a generalized form of the Flory Huggins model with three components, and um, has therefore more interaction parameters. Here, with two components, I only have one interaction parameter here, I need three interaction parameters. And the phase diagram now depends on two variables. You know, I always lose one variable by the procedure that I explained on the blackboard in the incompressible case. So I have a phase diagram which now depends on two volume fractions. And if I, have, let's, let's say, put phi to zero, sorry, psi to zero, that's the max five density, then I would be in my two component system which I described before. And then along this line, I see now the phase coexistence in the interval from here to here. But now if I increase the density of this regulator component, as we think of the max 5, then we're moving on this axis, and then the phase transition is modified. And um, at high concentration, everything is mixed. Um, that's what this particular phase diagram shows. And now the picture we're having is that if we are now in this embryo, where we have a gradient of max 5, then we, then we don't have an equilibrium condition because it's not homogeneous. The gradient is maintained by active processes. I don't want to go into, in, into details about that here. But the idea is that locally, you can still use a local equilibrium physics and think of what does the system do locally given its local composition. And then the argument is that at different poles of the embryo, we have different values of psi and of phi, and the system somehow anterior side and posterior side is at different sides of, in this phase diagram. 
In the interior side, the embryo is in the one-phase region, where everything mixes. And on the posterior side, it's in the two-phase region, where everything tends to demix. And then there's a gradient along the axis, and it somehow, somehow crosses the phase boundary. And in this situation, um, if you now take this local thermodynamics together with the gradient, you get this segregation, um, which, I, which you see in the embryo as a phenomenon. <clears throat> so, um, next thing I'd like to discuss, and it's also important when we discuss with these emulsions, where we have many droplets as a question. In the general thermodynamics, it is in general possible, and you can have as is, there's a so-called Gibbs phase rule, which tells you how many coexisting phases there are principle possible. The, the point is that in order to have more phases coexist, you need more parameters to adjust. If here, I just need one parameter. And then, I, 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 if I'm in the right region, I have two phases coexist. If I have a multi-component system and I want to have another phase coexist, then I have to adjust another parameter. And it gets more and more, the, the space where this happens gets narrower and narrower. But in principle, that's possible. And it's an interesting question whether cells use that physics or whether they don't use that physics, and that's something we could discuss. Yeah. But in principle, there can, in a multi-component system, there can be more phases coexisting. Um, and one sees evidence for this also in cells, and it's a very interesting and complex subject. But now I want to discuss the dynamics of droplets. So far, it was equilibrium. We want to understand the segregation. We have to go to dynamics of droplets. And um, let me first sketch how this works in general from the thermodynamic point of view. Because now we have to deal with the dynamics of spatially inhomogeneous concentration profiles. And this can be, again be done with the principles of irreversible, this can be done with the principles of irreversible thermodynamics by using local equilibrium and then ask how do thermodynamic imbalances drive the system in new states. And the way to do that in our droplet system would be to, to define a free energy of spatially inhomogeneous profiles first. The idea is that this free energy is now a spatial integral, a sum over many different regions, of my <coughs> function f of phi, which is the free energy per volume. And now I allow phi to be different at different positions. But in order so the f of phi was constructed for a spatially homogeneous system. To take into account the fact now that phi varies with position, we have to add an extra term that penalizes changes in phi that has the form gradient phi square with some coefficient. And it turns out if one does the physics, this term determines the interfacial tension between two coexisting phases. If one now looks for free energy profiles that connect two different coexisting phases. For the gradient term. Yeah. For the gradient term, it's enough to take the quadra guess, quadratic. But the, 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 I think usually you discuss the symmetries of f of phi. And there you have all orders, the way I write it down. So I, I, I have all orders here, here, but and I only need a, this term. Of course, I could add another one, but it doesn't really change anything. So, so the discussion is more about this function, which orders I need. Because I haven't done a Landau expansion here. Yeah? This is the full function f of phi. And since I don't do a Landau expansion, I have a complicated function. I have the Logarithms, yeah? if, I would, if I would do a Taylor expansion of the function, as you somehow indicate, that I would only have powers of phi, no logarithms. Yeah? So now the chemical potential gets a little bit more complicated, because now, because of this term, I have to take a functional derivative, and I don't just want to mention it here, um, which has the form df phi, that's the term we had before for the spatially homogeneous system. And then we have a, um, an extra term which comes from here. So the chemical potential has a contribution that comes from changes in phi also. And this was the chemical potential for the homogeneous system. And now, 
the dynamics of my concentration field is conserved because things can only move around, they cannot appear and disappear. Um, is now um, minus the divergence of some, some current. That's the conservation law. And the current, that's the rate at which molecules flow, um, is minus some coefficient times the gradient of the chemical potential, mu bar. That's the general rule for the thermodynamics of such systems. It is consistent with thermodynamic equilibrium and it describes the kinetics of the system in the vicinity of equilibrium. And um, sort of plugging this in here is the so-called Kahn-Hilliard equation, which describes phase separation. Now, in the case of droplets, we often use a simplification. It makes life easier, and I call this an effective droplet model. The idea is that we are not trying to calculate the detailed structure of the interface itself. We get going to the limit of strong segregation, where the two phases are really different. Interface is very, very thin. And I can think of the two phases as homogeneous um, phases, and they're connected by a sharp interface. And in that case, um, in each of these phases, things become much simpler. I can locally expand around the concentration of each phase, and I essentially end up with a diffusion equation in the two phases. You can have two different diffusion coefficients, but it's a simple diffusion equation. It's a limit of the more general kahn hilliard equation. So in each phase, we have liquid which, where with molecules diffuse, and then I have boundary conditions at the interface which take care of the thermodynamics of phase separation. So the diffusion equation is not smooth across the interface, but it, the concentration has to jump between these equilibrium values. And the equilibrium values themselves depend on the radius of the droplet. And then I have sort of mapped this more general, more complicated Van Hilliard equation, which is the correct thermodynamic description of my problem, to a diffusion problem with a non-trivial interface. And of course, the interface moves, so it's not, also not an easy problem to solve, but it's much easier than, than this one. Yes? That's why it's unpleasant to solve. I gotten rid of yeah, that's the limit. I I I gotten rid of it because it only plays really a role in the interface and is negligible in these phases. It's treated effectively by the boundary conditions. But if you it's correct, if you in principle you have a diffusion equation with a fourth order term as well. Um, but this defines then the ratio between this term and the fourth order term defines a length scale and is a microscopic small scale of the order of the interface itself. If you go beyond the interface, you don't see it. The neglecting, but inter interface is really important. This, this generates somehow the interface. But, but if I treat the interface just by this jump condition, I don't need it. And then it's hidden in the surface tension. And the surface tension is generated by this term and by this term. Now, all of this physics now has interesting consequences for the dynamics of an emulsion. And um, the, sort of the most striking is what is called Oswald ripening. That is that an emulsion of many droplets evolves over time, and droplets, um, some grow and some shrink. And the general rule is that if you, have a, if you have two drops of equal size, it's unstable. If one gets a little bit bigger than the other one, the bigger one takes up material from the smaller one. The smaller one disappears and the big one grows. And this is because of my conditions, the Laplace pressure, we have a different um, chemical potential of the surface of a small droplet as compared to the surface of a large droplet. The chemical potential gradient drives the diffusion flux. Now this, so this diffusion so this becomes a diffusion term um, if we have not no interfaces. So chemical potential gradients drive the diffusion, and that's why we have to transport from material from a small to a large one. 
And here I solve the Kahn-Hilliard equation, which I explain here, numerically for a droplet system, um, and you see the coarsening. Small droplets disappear and large droplets grow. Hmm. But the effective droplet model does the same. I can, can use both, both approaches. So now I would like to come from passive systems to active systems. And the um, point, of course, is that so far the emulsion I'm looking at is a boring emulsion. It's one where no interesting chemistry takes place. And of course, if we want to use this for biology, we want to have these droplets as being the centers in which all our interesting favorite reactions take place. And I will not go into complicated <coughs> concrete reaction schemes or even what might happen in chromatin, but rather do the simplest thing possible. Um, so I will take my two component system and add chemical reactions to it. And these chemical reactions, and this, in my simplest version of the problem, and of course I can generalize it, um, now allow for reactions that transfer A to B or B to A. And of course that's the basic idea, and I don't have so much time, so I also can lay out a more general case with arbitrary reaction networks, but I probably don't, won't have the time today. Um, so let's stick with the minimal model, yeah? If you want, yes. The material is transferred from the large to the, from the small to the large. I think that's what hap what's happening. It's harder to say what you see, but it's, it's what's happening. There is a fast relaxation process, sort of where all the droplets take up the material from the outside, so that the outside coexists with the inside. And then there's a slower process, which transfers material from the small one to the large ones by diffusion. And that's what we see here. Okay, so I have two components, A and B. The volume fraction of B is what I call phi, and then the volume fraction of A is forcibly one minus phi in my minimal model. And as I say, this is just for illustration, the general case is, allows me many components and arbitrary reactions, but that would mess up my slides, so that's why it's so simple. In this case, my, I'm using the effective droplet model. In principle, I can also use the Kahn-Hilliard equation, and I'll add the reaction to it. Here I take the simpler case of the effective droplet model where I have a diffusion equation and put a reaction term to it. Now it becomes a reaction diffusion problem, but with an interface and with the thermodynamics at the interface. And in the simplest case, so this reaction rate can be, can be written in such a form where Kf is a forward rate and Kb is a backward rate. And if Kf and Kb themselves are not dependent on, on composition, then these are first order reactions. But I can discuss your first order, higher order reactions in principle. Now, if we just have a system that consists only of those two components, um, essentially it's a passive system, again, even though reactions take place. And this is reflected the fact that reaction rates must obey what is called the detailed balance condition. It is consistency of chemical reactions with thermodynamics. And this can be expressed in the form that the rate the forward rate divided by the backward rate, this is not a flux. I think of this R as being has a component from the forward reaction from the backward reaction. This must be equal to an exponential of the free energy difference associated with the reaction, which is the difference in the chemical potentials of the involved species. Now, Looking at my time, so I think, yeah, in principle, maybe I can, can think of also doing that maybe tomorrow. But um, one can discuss this more generally and understand better how this is, for example, related in the simple case where we don't have phase separation. This will define us reaction constants and will give us the mass action kinetics of chemical reactions. If we have phase separation, all of these things no longer, are no longer so simple, and we mass action kinetics is actually no longer true. These are interesting consequences. And then, the rules, the thermodynamic rules don't change, but the detailed rules change because mass action kinetic is constructed for non-phase separating systems, for homogeneous systems. Um, 
But that's a condition that follows from thermodynamics. And if I think of the chemical potential as having an entropic term and an internal energy term, that's, one can always write in this form, um, in dilute solutions and in condensed solutions, this internal energy would depend on composition and to, to account for interactions between molecules. Um, we can sort of change from the flux to the rate, and then the ratio of forward to backward reaction rate is now an exponential of the difference in internal energies. And this has to do with the reaction constant that one usually discusses in chemistry. Now we have to put this in context to our phase separation problem. So we have concentrations inside and outside, and we have a free energy landscape. And what happens in general, if you have a situation like this, where we, let's say this point coexists with this point, what a chemical reaction now does is the individual molecule numbers are no longer conserved. Only the number of A plus B is conserved. In the case of normal phase separation, where molecules are individually conserved, the system cannot really change the average concentration. It can, it can demix and have a high concentration of one type here low there, but the molecule number doesn't change, and the average concentrations don't change. Now, these reactions here allow <laughs> concentrations to change, and the system can now find a, a thermodynamic equilibrium, which actually minimizes the function little f itself, while with the conservation law, this would not be possible. That's why we needed the Maxwell construction to create the thermodynamic equilibrium. So the chemical reaction, if the system coexists at these two points, the system can lower its free energy by transforming these molecules up here um, into molecules that sit sort of down here. And the system can remove the droplet as it minimizes the free energy. So the passive system typically when chemical reactions allow you to dissolve a droplet, they typically do dissolve the droplet. And one of the reasons already is that you can get rid of the surface tension energy that way. Now, the system without, without an interface has a lower free energy than the system with interface, and they can get rid of the, the droplet. So the droplets dissolve, we have sort of passive chemical reactions. What one needs to have active droplets is actually to keep the chemistry out of equilibrium. And one way to do that is to now couple the system to an external fuel reservoir. And now, thinking of biology, you always have ATP in mind as, a, as an example, which may be hydrolyzed to ADP. You have a reservoir of ATP at high concentration, which is provided all the time. And, and I can have a constant supply of, of ATP, and I always get rid of the products. And now I can, this fuel is a new component, C. But I don't want to go into a, the description of more components, which I could do, which makes it very messy. I rather want to keep the two components and keep the fuel sort of as a hidden variable. But what the fuel does, it couples to my reaction and can drive the reaction in the opposite direction that it would, would, would go in the absence of the fuel. And the reason is that if the fuel is present, what matters is the difference in chemical potential, including the chemical potential of the fuel and of the reaction products of the fuel. And therefore, since it's now not a difference between A and B itself, but because of the sum, the chemical reaction can run the opposite way if the fuel is coupled in the right way. And this is now a system where my reaction um, becomes active. Hidden is an energy, chemical energy supply from the fuel, chemical free energy change from the fuel and its reaction products. But I'm still keeping my two component system to not have a too complicated picture. The only thing that happens when I do that is I violate this detailed balance condition. Because if I have all components taken into account, there's again a detailed balance condition. But if I hide somehow the concentration C as an explicit variable, and I describe everything as if it would only could depend on A and B, then A and B no longer satisfy this detailed balance condition. That's what we call broken detailed balance. And that would allow us, and under broken detailed balance condition, the system will not be in equilibrium. And we can sort of play with that now by choosing reaction rates that do not obey detailed balance, implying that there is a fuel component C in the background supplying energy to the system constantly. And 
So what, an example what we've been using is reaction rate, which depends on concentration, but in a non-trivial way. Um, so this black line would, would be this dependence. And in this system, I can generate stable droplets that do not dissolve. And the example here would be, that would be the concentration field around the droplet center. Here's the high concentration inside the droplet, low concentration outside the droplet. There's a steady state with fluxes all the time. That's why there are concentration gradients. And outside the droplet, I mean this bluish region where the reaction goes from A to B. Inside the droplet, I'm in a greenish region. The direction is negative and goes from B to A. And this is maintained all the time. I'm producing, um, I'm losing droplet material inside and, and it diffuses out. And I'm generating droplet material outside, it diffuses in, and I have a non equilibrium steady state. And this generates stationary droplets. At least it can often do that. And this is the simplest case of an active droplet, non equilibrium system that turns itself over, it has a flux of material going in and out all the time, and interestingly, it has a fixed size. But the droplets that are passive, they always coarsen and get bigger and bigger and bigger. These droplets are now well-defined objects of a preferred size. If the droplet gets bigger, it shrinks, and if it gets smaller, it grows. And one can see that here, so without chemical reactions, if I draw the rate at which the radius grows or shrinks because of this diffusion process I explained before, as a function of droplet size. There's a so-called critical radius. The droplet has to be bigger than that in order to be able to grow. If it's smaller, it disappears. And then without chemical reactions, it will always grow. And that's why it grows to infinity and becomes a macroscopic droplet at large, large times. And this happened in practice with the Oswald ripening. Now, with chemical reactions, I get a curve which goes through zero and then becomes negative. That's my active droplet. And it has a size, r bar, which I can calculate as a function of chemical rates and diffusion coefficient. And this is an example here. I have a, a Panhillard equation without chemical reactions. Now I add reaction term to it. And this here I have the, the ripening. And here I generate um, a state which doesn't ripen, and where the droplets have all well defined sizes. <clears throat> this has to be maintained out of equilibrium. This coarsens all the time and reaches an equilibrium eventually after you have one big drop. Okay, now I'm doing with time. So I'm, I want now to come with this sort of background in the physics, discuss first a biological example, um, and then come to some other interesting consequences of the active droplet physics. Um, the activity was only in the breaking the detail balance of the chemical yes. reactions here. One could envisage this in a fluid like medium, active fluid like medium, and worry about the active stresses and flows. So, I'm, sense. so here you can also discuss the hydrodynamics and can turn this into an active fluid even without I'm not sure worrying about it. But here I'm not talking about the hydrodynamics. And the, I'm just wondering, is that relevant? Is it? You don't need it for the discussion I'm doing here. Um, I think that depends on how you set things up. In the simplest version I'm doing here, it changes the concentration profile inter inter interface slightly, and therefore it will ch have a small influence on the surface tension. I'm not sure if one can easily, in the effective droplet model, we wouldn't even take it into account. In the Canhillia, probably there will be a slight modification of the surface tension, but it's probably tiny. But then it depends all about whether you could also have reactions that are more pronounced in the interface or not in the interface. So there are lots of scenarios you can imagine. I'm just showing you the the simplest one by far, and there are lots of possibilities, and I think everything's possible here in this, along the lines that you're asking, but the simple version, I don't think it would be relevant. So let's come to the centrosome as a very important biological problem, and let's look at this from the perspective of droplet physics. Um, the centrosome organizes the mitotic spindle. Um, it has centrioles, which have a well-defined structure, and these are usually sort of highlighted, and these are certainly not droplet-like structures. These are, these are more crystal-like structures. And, but they nucleate the formation of a spherical blob around them of pericentriolar material, ECM. And the whole structure then is the signaling center in the cell. And um, 
this material here around the centrioles that assembles is a dense proteinic material that, um, because of the sphere, is likely that one can think in terms of surface tension. And it can come in different sizes. It can grow and shrink, like, like a droplet. And I can illustrate the dynamics in our C. elegans system. We label a component of the pericentriolar material, GFP. And what you'll see is we start from the embryo that is fertilized. Um, there are two centrosomes which grow to build the mitochondrial spindle. The cell divides. The centrosomes dissolve. The next, um, the daughter cells, the centrioles duplicate. And we have for each cell, again, two centrosomes. They grow. They form a spindle. The cell divides and so on. So you see here first the two centrosomes of the initial cell as they grow. And then this is the spindle. Now the spindle dissolves. We have two daughter cells, two centrosomes which grow. Cells divide. Centrosomes dissolve. New centrosomes grow, and so on and so forth. So we have many centrosomes in different stages, and they all grow, have a, have a certain size. They all assemble and disassemble. Um, they're all spherical. Here you see the size, the volumes, as a function of time in the different stages. One cell stage P0, two cells stage AB plus P1. I explained you these symbols yesterday. And um, you see, first we see that the bigger cells have bigger centrosomes. And we can see the different dynamics here. And one can find that the, essentially the volume of centrosomes is probably proportional to the volume of the cell. Um, And the picture that we're having is the following. The centrioles are nucleators somehow for, this drop, for these droplets. Let's call them droplets. You can not question exactly what the material properties are. Initially, the material of centrosomes is dissolved in the cytoplasm. Um, there's a soluble component. And then there is a, let's, let's say, this form A. And then there is a phosphorylation reaction mediated by polokinase, which brings it into a new conformation, which suddenly is phase separating. And forms, forms this droplet phase. And the phosphatase can really bring it back into form A. So we have exactly the scenario I outlined. And clearly here also detail balance is broken. The kinase needs ATP to function. It's the same picture. And now we can use our picture of, of the A and B phases. And, the, and we can write down our diffusion reaction equations for the problem. Using the conditions at the interface, we can play the whole game of this droplet physics. And um, the simplest case is, a, is a, a look at different growth scenarios. And what we realized is that the best picture to understand this problem is to think of the growth of the centrosome as an autocatalytic process. The idea is that in order to turn A into B, we need a droplet, or we need B. So B is the material that forms that. that that, this, that um, forms the droplet. And A is the soluble version. Between the two is the phosphorylation reaction. Now, one picture is that the, that the kinase sits on the droplet and is activated by the droplet. So you have to come to the droplet to, to be transferred to form B. And then we have this type of reaction scenario, where A plus B gives 2B. Um, and this gives us all the features we need to understand the experiments. What it means is there's an nucleation event, which produces a nascent droplet. And we have to explain in a moment how this happens. And then this nascent droplet grows by an autocatalytic reaction. And that's why we have this dramatic growth. Of the first autocatalytic would look like this. The autocatalytic reaction looks like this. And when the material is used up, we saturate. Now, the problem of an autocatalytic reaction is of course, the good side is that it assembles very rapidly. But it was like an explosion. The moment it's set off, it, it goes very fast. Um, but um, nucleation is difficult. On the other hand, because nucleation is difficult, we can really control it. We have to control it very precisely. In the case of the first order kinetics, um, it's very hard to control nucleation because then there is no there is no problem of much less of a problem to generate the droplet in the first place. And the autocatalytic assembly has to start in a way that is not autocatalytic. Now, the idea, the idea is that everything is set, set off by the centrioles. The centrioles are the regulator of the nucleation after which the autocatalytic reaction takes place. So the idea then is that the centrioles 
on their surface have enzymes that catalyze the reaction from A to B, even in the absence of B. That's the only exception from this rule that it's an autocatalytic rea reaction is on the surface of the centriole. And that can account for most of what we know and also accounts for the fact that the number of centrosomes is so precisely regulated in the cell, given that the number of centrioles is precisely regulated. In our equation, this gives us extra flux boundary conditions on the surface of the centriole in the center of our droplet. And then after we have a tiny surface layer of B, we can grow the droplet. And this model can account for, for the growth observed in the, the C elegans at different stages. Um, so we have the same set of parameters for all these stages. It's a quite, um, it, it provides a lot of insights into, into the process. Interestingly, um, um, we also have an issue of oscillate ripening in the case. If we have normal droplets, we'd be worried to have two droplets of equal size, uh, as we have with two centrosomes. But it turns out in this, in this system, there is no droplet oscillate ripening if this chemical activity of this centrioles is strong enough. And by the way, there's a second way to suppress oscillate ripening by activity. And I showed you the droplets which have finite sizes before. This is also a suppression of oscillate ripening by chemical reactions. So generally, we have with chemical reactions often cases where oscillate ripening is suppressed. And we can have here, because of the active core in the center, we can have a stable state of two equally sized centrosomes. This would be a dynamic system diagram of the dynamics of the radii of two centrosomes. Um, if the centri centriole activity is switched off, there's only one big droplet and one is zero <laughs> as steady states, and two equal ones are unstable. And if we switch on the centriole activity, we get a steady, stable, steady state with two coexisting. Centrosomes. And then we can do interesting perturbations in the experiments. Um, one can, so the, in, the, in the normal case, of course, we have two equal centrosomes on both sides, the spindle, they have the same size. Now I can make a perturbation uh, with an RNAi technique to make the two centrosomes unequal. That's because centriole duplication implies that one is older than the other. So in fact, the centrioles are not quite the same. And because they, the, the duplication process can be manipulated, one can have two different centrioles. And then we assembled two different sizes of droplets around these centrioles. And it, the sum of the two volumes is the same as the sum of those two volumes. So the same material is assembled, but now unequally. And this is also captured by our theory if we assume two different centriole activities. Then we can understand the two different sizes of material being assembled on the two centrioles. Finally, the same model can also account for the position of centrioles in the center of the centrosomes, again mediated by the activity of the centriole, its chemical activity to catalyze the reaction. Um, without this centriole activity, this parameter Q is the activity of the centriole, the centriole would diffuse in a droplet, and it would be unlikely to find it quite in the center. But the moment we switch on this activity, it gets stably positioned in the center. And this follows also from the droplet dynamics if we solve the equations, but we can actually do a stability analysis of this symmetric state, and one finds that it's stable when, when the centriole activity is there. And that has to do with the fact that if, it's, if we move the centriole out of the center of the droplet, then we get an unequal dynamics of the, of the surface to bring it back to the center. And this is sort of explains his observations. So this is an EM of a centri centrosome. These are the two centrioles that form the, the centriole pair inside the centrosome. Um, and they are at the geometric center of the sphere. And in fact, one of the two is, is, is more central than the other. And we think that there's one of the two that actually plays, has this activity. OK, that was the discussion of the um, of the centrosome as an example of how this droplet physics is extremely useful to look at spatial organization of cellular processes. And in the remaining few minutes, um, I want to take a different, broader view, um, starting from the point of view that the centrosome is an exception, but most of the other droplets in cells that we find 
are protein RNA assemblies. For some reason, RNA proteins and RNA binding proteins, RNA processing proteins, somehow form these condensates, which are compartments, which have some functions like stress granules, like P granules, that are not fully understood, but that are important for the cell. Um, and this is a phenomenon that's not only in the few cells that I'm showing you here, but it's essentially all organisms that we know of, at least eukaryotic organisms, have these RNA protein condensates as organelles. As, and they form by the simple physical chemistry of phase separation. That's, that's how, they, how they create spherical small structures in space, which suggests that this is a very old evolutionary um, so it's sort of for a long time this, this, this exists as a phenomenon. It's a very simple physical chemistry. So we can ask whether this also helps us to understand um, very early cells and evolution um, where such simple physical chemistry may have been even more important. And this brings us sort of back to this classical idea um, from Alexander Operin, but also Haldane, who suggested that somehow the very first cells, or maybe just before the, the real cells emerged, chemistry had to be organized in space by simple physical processes. And um, the idea is that macromolecules made, made form coacervates, phase separate, um, and form droplet-like structures in which prebiotic chemistry was organized. And our active droplet model is a very nice system to study this idea and to investigate the physics of such a system. So I'm using this very simple model that I explained before. Um, now as a physical model for, uh, let's say, a, a prebiotic droplet cell that, and the, that turns over by chemical reaction. So there is some material um, which feeds the growth of my, of my droplet. The, the droplet itself, which is B-rich, can turn B into A by a chemical reaction, and A leaves the droplet, and we have a steady state that turns over this droplet. And as I showed you before, this droplet will have a well-defined size, a steady state. Um, it turns over, so they can think of this as a prebiotic metabolism that takes place. It's non-equilibrium. This only exists if we drive the system out of equilibrium. At equilibrium, all of this disappears. And we can now ask whether this helps us to build a sort of a protocell. And of course, in order to have something that looks cell-like, we would want it to divide, to be able to, to at least be able to multiply by division type of phenomena. And the interesting insight from the system is that this comes naturally with the model. So this system can undergo a shape instability and divide. Here I show you sort of calculated shapes. And, um, the point is that a steady state with fixed size can be stable or it can become unstable towards splitting. And here I show you the solution of this kahn hilliard equation with chemical reactions in the regime where the spherical, the, so there's a regime where the radius is stationary but the shape is not. And then this tends to split. And this is an example of this case. Exactly the calculation, the equation which I, which I explained here that is solved, and it splits in two. Now, after it splits in two, it's smaller than before. And what happens first is that it tends to grow because it's now below its optimal size. And at the small size, the shape, the spherical shape is not unstable. So it will first grow again to get a bigger size, and then the shape becomes unstable and divides again. So we, I'll show you in a moment this growth and division. But before that, let me show you here this phase diagram that we can calculate. So essentially, we have two axes. One describes um, they describe the chemical activity. Roughly speaking, this describes the strength of the A to B reaction. This describes the strength of the B to A reaction, which are not linked by a detailed balance condition because we are out of equilibrium. And if the B to A reaction is very fast, then everything dissolves. If it's smaller, given the A to B reaction, everything, we have a stable spherical droplet of the type I explained earlier in my talk, which has a well-defined size. And if we're now sitting here and we're increasing the A to B reaction, then we're moving across this line and the droplet becomes unstable and, and split. And here I show you a solution, um, same equation, which goes 
as more than one division is done in a, in a cubic box, and we can have these cycles of growth and division which are reminiscent of cell division um, in this very, very simple system. So this calculation doesn't have noise in it. So there's no randomness. Everything is deterministic. But there, there's a very good point. So first thing is, of course, the very first division is biased by the box. Because I do it in a box, I have boundary conditions at a box, and they break my rotational symmetry. And also, you have seen that it was not pos positioned in the center. So this breaks the symmetry. And therefore, the initial first division axis is set by the conditions of the box. After I divide, the next division is perpendicular to the first one. And that could also be influenced by the box, or perturbed by the box. But if the box is far away, if you have two droplets next to each other, and they divide again, their division axis is set by the position of the other, because the two droplets um, affect each other. And there is an axis connecting the, the two drops, which defines an axis along which it will not divide again. That's why it divides in a particular direction. So in fact, it divides perpendicular to the axis before, which surprisingly is exactly what you see in biology, but here for a completely different reason. Yeah. OK, so we have here a simple model for a protocell, which is purely physical, which doesn't, doesn't have any. So it has some, some sort of primitive metabolism. It has division on growth far from, from equilibrium. It doesn't need any membranes. And here, there is no, no information content. So it's, one would have to add genetics to this to make this sort of um, a cell. Um, with that, I think um, my time is up. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions? I didn't explain it. Um, first, um, we just could calculate that it exists. And then we don't know the reason, but if it happens. Huh? So the shape becomes unstable, which means that if the droplet tends to deform in spherical harmonic modes, it's an L equals 2 mode, which becomes unstable. And um, now, there is a similarity to this problem to the so-called um, mullins karaka instability of crystals. If you have, um, and that's something which is, for example, also relevant to things like snowflake shapes. Um, so if you have a growing front because of material coming to the front, then you can have an instability that if there's one region which grows faster than the, than the remaining, the neighboring regions, that the diffusive flux more efficiently adds to the tip rather than to the valley. And then the tip grows and the valley remains behind. And that typically happens at a certain wavelength. And this problem is related in the sense that you have a flux going on an interface. But the difference is the interface does not advance because we are starting from a steady state droplets because we are having a flux of molecules that go to the droplet and a flux of molecules that go out. So we are having this type of instability not on a moving front, but on a stationary front. And that's why, in our case, it can divide, because it actually it will invaginate. While if you do that with a growing sphere, you will only grow fingers on the surface. And that will be like, like snowflakes in some sense. And um, so it's related to the modern Sakarika instability and has similar reasons that if you grow a tip, that somehow the diffusive flux favors a tip. Um, are you planning to, uh, to observe uh, this protocell uh, experimentally? So I'm a theorist, so I'm, I, it's not me myself, but of course we're having colleagues who work on that, and I think other groups also try to do that. And it's an interesting challenge to come up with a good chemical system which has the, has the features that one, one needs, but it's, it's a very interesting project. In case of stress granules, why, why is there 
uh, in case of stress granules, why is there phase separation? I mean, you, you're not changing the phi in case of stretching the cells, right? You're asking what is the control parameter for? Exactly. I don't know what the control parameter for stress granules is, but as I've shown you, you can have one component that controls it, like with MAX5. You know? um, I don't know what, what it is in the case of, but, but just producing RNA would be enough, just, just producing one component, it would be enough. Having phosphorylation change of some component, as I've seen with centrosome, is enough. So prob probably, maybe the best answer to give is, you need some kinase to phosphorylate some protein, then it happens. I have a little bit of confusion with regard to the segregation of pea granules in the uh, posterior part of the cell. So can I say that the anterior part is wholly free from pea, pea, pea granules? I don't understand you very well. The anterior part? Anterior part. Uh, is it completely free from pea, pea granules? Not sure what you mean by completely free. I mean, the segregation the happens. Or what can you detect? Uh, no, what I'm trying to ask is the segregation of P granules towards the, uh, happens towards the posterior part of the cell. Yeah. Uh, during the cell division. So we don't see any P granules on the in anterior. the anterior part. Yes. So it's completely. It doesn't free mean that it's completely free. Because one thing is what we can see, and what seems what thing there could still be things that we can't see. Okay. So you say it might not. I mean, it is not. I, I, I don't want to commit to there's nothing there. I'm just saying that non detectable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you began the simulation with uh, one uh, bubble, but what if you begin without any f uh, phases separate? Would it still give similar results? Um, so there's no noise here, so there's no spontaneous nucleation. And of course, I don't really want to have spontaneous nucleation. I would like to generate new droplets only by division. But if I am in a regime where I have no spontaneous nucleation, and I don't start with a droplet, I don't get a droplet. So the f creation of the first droplet is the magic event that I cannot explain here. So how do you determine the critical radius beyond which the cell decides to divide? Um, you're talking about instabilities, but I didn't know. Instability, you can calculate the radius. So, so what you do is, first you calculate the steady state with spher spherical symmetry. And there's a well-defined radius that you can calculate that is stable, that you always find. And now you can ask, if you have this phi with this radius, which is a stable radius, and you make a small shape perturbation, does the shape perturbation relax back to the sphere, as it should because of surface tension, usually with normal droplets. Um, so surface tension acts to bring it back to a sphere. That's, that's why droplets are spherical. Now these droplets, you can have a situation because of the chemical activity and the diffusion flows, that a spherical droplet, if you deform it a little bit, moves away from the sphere. And this we can calculate. Actually, what you do is you decompose it in spherical harmonics, and you find that the L equals 2 mode becomes unstable, and, and you know exactly at which point this has happens, and why well, the radius doesn't change. The, the radius, the spherical radius is, is stable. Uh, one question. When you have the active process, and uh, uh, the droplet without an active process, is the noise statistics a bit different? Which is significantly different? Can you flush out the noise the B, when you have the autocatalytic reaction in a very small volume? You'll have noise, but if you have a flux going on, can you act? So one can add noise to these equations. And um, the simplest way to do that first is at equilibrium, where we know how to add the noise. Non-equilibrium, we can also add noise. Um, but then we have less strict rules. I was wondering whether this environment is uh, uh, the droplets, uh, the yeah. reaction will see a little bit less noise if you have active process. I don't know. It's, I mean, there was no analysis of it yeah. so far. So it, we have just finished the work which goes along the lines, and maybe that's related to what, what you're asking. So one can use this phase separation physics and the fact that phase coexistence sets concentrations to buffer noise of stochastic reactions in, 
in the system. Some sort of this one can do, and we have actually a preprint on the, on I think on the bio archive. Some sort of low pass filtering you can do, or is something different? I didn't understand. Low pass filtering we usually do to sub subdue the noise. In the there is certainly a low pass filter aspect to it. Yeah. I'll just have a look at yeah. the preprint. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, just a question. So in the uh, droplets where they were growing and dividing, since you said there, is, there was no stochastic component, uh, so there was no stochasticity in the division plane as well, correct? Yeah, in what I showed you, there was no noise. So so was, we, we, uh, we can all simulate it with noise. Yeah. I didn't show you any examples uh, of that. I was just simply wondering if you had some simple noise at for the division plane, right? So the size of the daughter droplets. If you add noise, the, you will get noise on the division plane. but. But it's still true that if you have the division on one axis, that the next division which will be most likely perpendicular. Yeah, and then no, you have but but, but if, if you had asymmetric division there, would you end up with the same, like, would it affect the growth and the division process that you're seeing, or it would have no effect? You're not talking about the droplet division, yeah? yeah I'm, I am, but, but uh, no, I'm talking about if in the droplet division. Yes. But that division is asymmetric. I don't know how to do asymmetric division in the, in the droplet. Oh, so, I mean, if you were just to simply add some noise to the position where they're going to You're saying divide. there might be some, some fluctuations in the size. Yes, because in reality there is, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if the stability of the system is robust if you add fluctuation in the pl uh, at the division plane. Like, or the, uh, we, we are, I think fluctuations you add in a bulk everywhere, you know, yes. in directions and so on. So and if we add fluctuations, you still get a double division. Oh, so it wouldn't affect the... I'm not sure what... It's fluctuating, so it yes. does affect, but you still get division. Okay, but you get noisy division, yeah. but you get nice division. But that is, that didn't show, yeah, and that's oh. also ongoing work. Yeah. Oh, so that you have done that as well? We're doing that, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, we're having noisy simulations of that. I have a question. Yeah, so um, this um, last example of a protocell growing and dividing, what might be an empirical realization of this one? Uh, is there any uh, empirical realization as of now? And if not, then uh, what kinds of chemicals do you think might, uh, might work here? Yes, yeah, so um, one way to, so to implement that would be using biological molecules, which is probably the easiest way because it's easy, it's easy to find molecules that, for example, using phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, you can could directly switch states. Um, but this hasn't been done, but I think people, people work on that. And the, what is, would be more interesting would be to use simple non-biological <coughs> molecules. Um, and then one has to come up with, 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 um, with model systems of the phase separation. Um, I, I, I'm, I have to remember what, what we've tried, what we've looked at. Um, but one, one system was based on polyethylene glycol phase separation, plus some um, modifications to, to, to add a chemistry to it. So, so one idea is to start with a system that, that does phase separation and, and to modify it in a way to be able to affect it chemically. Yeah, yeah there also needs, um, so we have looked at parameters, what one needs that this works, and what, one, what we find is that it works best particular for its own size range of the droplets. So it doesn't work well with macroscopic droplets, but it works well with micrometer sized droplets. So if you have just micro, a few micrometers, that's the best regime to make it work. And then of course, it depends a bit on the reaction rates that you have. But um, I would have to, it's a somewhat complex discussion about the parameter regime where it works. Because of course, it's not a, not a matter of absolute rates because you can also rescale time. So it, it's a relationship in diffusion coefficients and rates and so on. And what also matters is the thickness of the interface. But putting this together and looking at typical values, we find that you want to operate in the micrometer regime of, of sizes. And it would be a protocell regime. That's, that's interesting, yeah. Hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still not convinced with the fact uh, um, with respect to the anterior and the posterior part of the cell. So, I must find it very hard to understand you. I'm sorry. Uh, during the cell division, yeah. there is an anterior part, uh, and then there is a posterior part. Yes. So the anterior part goes on to become the somatic cell, and then the posterior part goes on to become the germ cell. 
So the segregation of pregranules goes uh, is towards the P, uh, posterior part. Yes. So we differentiate uh, uh, somatic cells from germ cells with the presence of uh, pregranules. So would it be wrong to say that the anterior part uh, is free from uh, pregranules? I don't know if it's wrong or right. I just I find it just in a statement that I cannot. I mean, if there are cannot, if uh, there is a presence of pregranules in the anterior part, then that wouldn't be. Uh, but somatic cells. Still, they dissolve in the anterior side. So there may still be components of peak granules floating around. And also, we don't know if there are small objects still there that we can't detect with our microscope. But so the system, I, I think the system is not perfect in the sense that it might have perfect segregation. But of course, it's hard to see how imperfect it is. So from the perspective of our simple experiments, it looks perfect. But uh, am I wrong when I say uh, the absence of pregranules in a cell um, makes it a somatic cell? I don't think that's a correct statement. I, I, I wouldn't make the statement. Okay. I, but I don't know. I think these things are not really understood. I see. I think the, the reverse is true. The cell with pregranules makes it a precursor of the germline. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So initially, uh, you have one cell, and after getting some nutrients and uh, reaching to certain radius, it will divide. Uh, so that moment you will have two, uh, two cells, and that way that will divide into four cells. So that will multiply in that way. Now, you add some kind of stochasticity in it, so the cell division of a particular cell will, uh, will vary. I mean, the probability will change, so that will be more uh, uh, real system, I mean, that will be more real if you uh, take into account in it. What is the question? Uh, I mean, I understood the question. model is totally deterministic. So if you add some kind of noise, so... We can add noise to it, yeah, then it's no longer deterministic. Probability of division of a cell will vary. So uh, if, you, if I have uh, four number of cells for a certain amount of time, so in... So if the noise is weak, then it's just fluctuating around what you saw. Yeah? And the division comes from an instability. Yeah? So I don't think it's not noise driven. Yeah? Don't need the noise for it. The noise just modulates a little bit. So you're considering if you have four number of cells, after, after uh, next time I mean, you'll get eight number of cells, or um, you had some kind of noise in it? So it's difficult to exactly. So, so far, we haven't been able to, to do, calculate this huge system. And so it's difficult to answer what happens after these few divisions that I show you. One idea is, of course, that if you have an infinite box which provides reservoirs far away, and you have sort of a propagating front of divisions into the system, that could be the case. You're considering that all the cells have equal probability to divide? I don't, I don't think in terms of probabilities here. It's about the stability and instability. So, so it's a dynamic process, and it could be, but I don't know, that there's a propagation of this division into the, in the large system. Um, and then the, if you have a dense packing of these droplets, they are probably not able to divide again locally. But it's, it's a complicated system, so I, can't, I don't know exactly what happens in a huge, big system, because we are, it's, it's not, the problem is solving these equations numerically is not so easy. And that has to do with the fourth derivative. Um, and um, therefore, the boxes that we're using are limited in size. I would like to push the box very far, but I, and, and these, these simulations take quite some time. So I think we have to work out very efficient numerical algorithms to answer that. Last question. Uh, so I wanted to ask, is the process of uh, Oswald ripening is yes. it distinct from nucleation? Or are they uh, the same thing, basically? Oswald ripening is really the dynamics of droplets after they formed, which causes the emulsion, and at the end, so you have, you have sort of a steady increase of droplet size and a reduction in number. And um, you have a characteristic size distribution of droplets, which then shifts towards larger droplets. It's also a ripening. And nucleation is something different. Nucleation means that you start from a homogeneous mixture by fluctuation, there are unit fluctuations, you create spontaneously a new, new droplet. That's a rare event. And for that, you need fluctuations.
you start from a homogeneous state and you drive it in a supersaturated regime and you add noise, then you get nucleation of droplets and then you get Oswald right. Okay. And this is spontaneous nucleation, which is noisy. In the biological case, nucleation will, may often be controlled, regulated, and then it may not be so stochastic. Like, like in the centrosome case, yeah, you don't see stochasticity in nucleation because it's really precisely regulated. In the peak granule case, you see more stochasticity. But also there, I suspect that nucleation is usually regulated and controlled. There are nucleators in the cell. And then it's different from the homogeneous nucleation scenario, which waits for a rare fluctuation. Um, nucleation only happens if you're in a supersaturated concentration regime. The moment you nucleate droplets, you reduce the concentration in the in outside, and you're going away from the, from, from the set of supersaturation regime, and then you don't, don't nucleate anymore. So you would first nucleate and then do have also a drive. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Frank. Let's thank Frank once again.